Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to start off this morning uh, before introducing our speaker by asking our current chief resident, uh, Kira Hennessy, if she could name the seven CanMeds competencies. The first one is health advocacy, yes. That's what we're talking about this morning. Um, Dr. Deramsey is uh, actually a PhD educator uh, appointed in the um, Department of Family Medicine who started off as a teacher uh, and then went on to do a master's and a PhD. Um, and he's also the associate director, as you see, uh, for the UBC Center for International Health. And uh, we've asked him to come and talk to us about the health advocacy role, which is probably the uh, most woolly of the seven CADMEDS roles, which we're responsible for modeling, teaching, and evaluating. And uh, he's going to uh, give us some insights on how to do that, uh, hopefully in a relatively painless and non-threatening way. And so without further ado, I'll, uh, uh, I'll let Dr. Garamsey take the podium. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a real honor to be here um, speaking to you this morning. I've had the privilege of doing similar rounds for a range of disciplines now, and uh, uh, at some point also had the privilege to work more directly with residents to talk about what this might look like uh, in the curriculum. Certainly it can't be something that uh, is seen as yet another imposition uh, on your learning. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we can make this happen. I've got a short presentation and then open it up for discussion. I'm not sure if there are others who are joining us elsewhere. Uh, I, can't see, I can't see them, but perhaps during the discussion time, if there is someone there, um, we'll get an opportunity to hear from them as well. So I'll begin with a case study. And this is one that's not unique uh, to any one particular discipline. So your department has recently had a Royal College review, received accolades for strengths in the medical expert role, however, has been cited for deficiency in the health advocate role. This is a common story everywhere. The residency program committee has been gathered to discuss the matter. The committee has brought in an expert for advice. The experts suggest that efforts to integrate health advocacy into the training program is likely to be more effective if it's undertaken using the participatory approach, so actively involving residents and others. The committee is convinced and decides to involve the urology residents in reviewing the identified weaknesses in the existing curriculum and to develop and plan to correct them with a focus on the health advocate role. A session with the residents is organized. The expert gives a passionate lecture on health advocacy and urology training and invites questions at the end. After an awkward silence, the chief residence perhaps says, health advocacy is important, but we really need to develop proficiency in clinical and surgical skills. The other stuff we can figure out later, once we get going into our careers. Several residents nod in agreement. Now this is an experience that I've had throughout uh, uh, this project. My research has been funded by the Royal College, and the aim for me is to begin to get a sense of how is health advocacy taught? How can it best be learned? Uh, and how can it be assessed? What's happening at the moment? What's not happening? And where do we need to go from here? And that, in my opinion, is in and of itself um, on the road to uh, enabling the health advocate role. So we can't deny that we do really well in preparing uh, our, our future physicians to understand, diagnose, and treat disease, but primarily through clinical, surgical, and pharmaceutical interventions. It's certainly part of our core mandate in residency training. We've developed a really sophisticated technological, scientific, and organizational infrastructure to support this mandate. We raise tons of money to do so. We spend millions to sustain it. We've got state-of-the-art equipment, just look at the, excellence, uh, the Center for Excellence on Surgical Education Innovation. Each one of those mannequins costs up to $250,000. So we spend a lot of money to, uh, on, the, on the medical expert role. So in, in terms of privilege, uh, we're certainly in a privileged environment uh, from that point of view. But it's also been suggested that there's a disproportionate focus on biomedical intervention in light of the influence of the various determinants of health. So in terms of uh, percentages, 
biological endowment, genetics, how much impact do you think that has on health outcomes? 20, 30, 40, 50 percent? Just throw out a number. 25 percent? What about the physical environment? 30%? What about the healthcare system? <laughs> it's about 20 to 25%. The social determinants of health, and Clyde Hertzman, many of you probably know here at UBC with the help, the Human Early Learning uh, Program. Uh, published a, a really influential article in, in The American Scientist, and he says that the principal factors responsible for increasing life expectancy from less than 50 years to more than 70 in wealthy countries are to be found outside the healthcare system, as it's traditionally defined, and instead in the broader socioeconomic environment. Health, uh, the recent Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I don't know if you access that website, uh, they've done a, an extensive study on uh, uh, health in various counties across the U.S. So you can choose any county and get a sense of what's happening there. And, and the message that's come back uh, just about a week ago is that health lives outside the doctor's office, right? Health happens where we live, work, and play. And much of what influences how healthy we are and how long we live happens outside. Slum housing, rates of high school graduation, air pollution levels, unemployment levels, fast food restaurants, liquor store density. Did you know that if you look at the, uh, the US map, uh, census and you look at where all of the low socioeconomic areas are, that's where the highest uh, liquor store density is. So something to think about. So the question that I would ask you is what good does it do to treat people's illness only to send them back to the environment that brought them to you in the first place? There are a number of terms that you've probably come across. Vulnerability is one of them, and I'm just going to quickly go over some of the definitions. So to be vulnerable uh, is when there are various social, economic, political, environmental, or biological conditions that prevent people from protecting their own needs and interests. We know that vulnerable people experience worse health outcomes, they face higher barriers to care, higher rates of morbidity and mortality than the general population and they have little or no control over the conditions that contributed to their situation. You've probably heard of the term disparities. Now those are the differences in incidence and prevalence, mortality, burden of disease, and other adverse conditions that exist among specific populations. And you know, at some point at the end, we might talk about how, in your particular discipline, you are starting to see among your patient population, communities, and, and in society, uh, you're starting to see vulnerability, disparities, and disadvantage. Those who compared with the majority suffer from poor health, of course, fewer opportunities, or reduced access to services. So, you know, these words sort of start to blend together. The seven can med roles, professionalism, communicator, collaborator, manager, health advocate, and scholar. So about a decade ago, the, uh, the Royal College um, introduced this CANMED framework in effect to improve patient care. And so what they did was they wanted to articulate a comprehensive definition for the competencies needed uh, for medical education and practice. And today this, this uh, CANMED framework has been adopted all around the world. So you have this thing called the health advocate role. What is it? And this is what they say. A physician's duty to identify and respond appropriately to the needs of vulnerable and marginalized populations. Okay. You're required to attend to the ethical and professional issues inherent in health advocacy, including altruism, social justice, autonomy, integrity, and idealism. How do you learn altruism? How do you assess it? What's social justice within the context of your discipline? How do you teach someone to be idealistic? Now, I also sit on sort of, uh, um, I sit on the inter interview uh, panel for residents who come into family medicine, but also for, for medical students. And many of them come in sort of really bright eyed and idealistic. Um, but the literature suggests that it gets beaten out of you very quickly as you go through medical school. So, what's happening in the curriculum? I'm going to share some, some literature with you afterwards. 
So here are some of the key competencies that you're able to respond to health needs of communities that you serve. But what does that mean? What might that look like? And that's why I'm suggesting we use a participatory approach. You sit down within your department and start to unpack some of these things and start to identify what this might look like in residency training, in practice, even perhaps identify some, some uh, clinicians out there who are in some capacity doing this. And I don't mean sort of your Julio Montaners of the world, but just your everyday urologist who is in some capacity within the context of their own understanding practicing what they see as health advocacy. Identifying determinants of health in the population that you serve and promoting the health of individual patients and populations. Well, what does it mean to promote health? Um, in 2007, the Committee on Accreditation of the Canadian Medical Schools, CACMS, and the LCME in the US introduced accreditation standards to ensure that future physicians are taught well about healthcare disparities and the development of solutions to these burdens, the importance of meeting healthcare needs, of medically underserved populations, and to develop core professional attributes such as, again, altruism and social accountability. So now it's an accreditation standard. I had the privilege to work with some really uh, uh, great people to begin to look at how an undergraduate, in the undergraduate curriculum, we might achieve this. And we've introduced, uh, I don't know if you know about the Doctor Patient Society course, but we've introduced a community-based component where students can uh, begin to through experiential learning, uh, work in and with communities. Uh, and that's been hugely successful. I mean, you know, you can't teach health advocacy by standing up, in, uh, up here in front of you at 7 a.m. in the morning and lecturing to you about it. I think it's something that you need to see what this might look like in your hands. A recent study by Wu and colleagues, and this is a part of my literature review uh, for the study that's now, now funded, and this was published in CMAJ. And they found that many of the next generation of physicians appear to hold negative attitudes towards patients of low socioeconomic status. Many are reluctant to address the needs of vulnerable populations. What's happening? There's a sense that medical education itself is having a negative influence on student attitudes generally, particularly around social issues in medicine and particularly towards indigent and underserved patients. What's happening? Some are suggesting that medical education is so focused on the technical and scientific aspects of healthcare that most learners, residents and undergraduate medical students alike, begin to quickly surmise that courses dealing with the science and the clinical art of medicine are more important than courses dealing with communication skills, empathy, and the social determinants of health. I remember when my mother-in-law was diagnosed at 47 with cancer. And it was extensive. It had spread everywhere. And a brilliant surgeon uh, who operated on, our, on her invited the family into a room. We waited for him. He came in, sat down, looked at us, and we were, you know, our faces were quite glum. Got up and said, just give me a second. He left. Came back a minute later uh, with some Kleenex and passed it around. And he said, she has three months to live. My office is down next door. If you have any questions, just come and ask. And he left. There are several studies, including my own, that suggest that uh, the currency to graduate uh, is not social determinants or health advocacy. The curriculum is so focused, and this is from one of my studies, uh, so focused on getting students through the process that the currency to graduate is not community service, but passing tests and getting clinical credits. You'll have students tell you what you're trying to teach me is a waste of time. Uh, Wooly is one term that uh, has been brought forward. People call it fluff. If it's not billable, it's not going to be done. Is social consciousness billable? This was an educator uh, and a department head from, from a particular discipline. There's no doubt whatsoever that this has become an example of the negative impact of the monetarization of medicine. This is part of my PhD studies. And there are several other studies that show that respect for patients is severely compromised when medical educators um, and their students and residents begin to view and treat patients as objects of medical education and research, and, uh, which is now being observed as a common phenomenon in clinical teaching. 
Yet there are others that feel that this lack of empathy also has to do with the patterns of influences on professional socialization. I don't know how many of you have remember the, the classic study, Boys in White. That was, I think, in the 60s. Studies have shown that as students go through medical stu- school, they initially identify more closely with patients, seeing themselves as caregivers and advocates for patients. But as they move towards residency, they identify more with their professional colleagues and develop a primary allegiance with members of their profession. Although the issues around social responsibility in medicine is considered critical by medical educators, existing professional socialization within the healthcare system diminishes the importance of social over biological influences, which remain very strong. This is something that I circulated. Uh, I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to read it. Uh, It's probably an an, an attachment that Keiko sent around. Uh, And um, I understand that uh, your own program director has written a response to this. How many of you have not read it? Or did you get a chance to look at this article? No, it would be a good one to to look at. It was a Canadian-wide study which found that uh, 20% of urology residents were not aware that the health advocacy competency existed. Only 11% felt that it was frequently addressed by their attending staff in clinical settings. And nearly one half didn't have a mentor to emulate in health advocacy and urology. Of reassurance was that two thirds of the respondents, these are residents across Canada, uh, felt that participation in health advocacy activities was an obligation of physicians and surgeons. Sarita Verma, who who's also uh, participated in the Royal College Reviews recently, um, she was here in, in uh, reviewing the Department of Family Practice just last year. She and her colleagues uh, published uh, a piece uh, looking at, the, they surveyed faculty and residents from across sections of specialties at Queen's University in 2002. One urologist participated. Findings were similar to this current study None of the residents knew what the health advocate role was and what the expectations were of learners. Faculty and residents learned about health advocacy from role models, and that's something that I'm getting a a sense of from my study right now, Um, and from an innate sense of the values, and, 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 and there's a sense that this is something that can't be taught. It's something that you're brought up with uh, in your formative years. You know, you can't be, uh, um, Altruism is something that you grow up with. It's early socialization. That's certainly one theory. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced. There's some literature to suggest otherwise. So when I circulated the objectives of my presentation today, these were the objectives that I shared. To explore with you uh, what health advocacy looks like from the perspective of your discipline. To explore with you how best the roles and responsibilities around health advocacy can be learned, looking at the challenges that I've described in the literature. How would we assess this role? Should it be assessed? If you do that, does it become just another hoop that you need to jump through? What are some of the enablers that exist and how do we exploit or capitalize on those? And what are some of the best practices that are aspired to? With that, I'd like to leave... uh, Uh, the floor open for for discussion because I think that that's what will make this rounds far more fruitful. Yeah. I think there's a general decline in volunteerism compared to Dr. Goldberg's generation. Getting young people involved with professional organizations, for example, is becoming more and more difficult. And as Dr. Neely would say, it's like the SDP principles Um, you know, I find this with activities that are outside 
Yeah, and, and your first comment, there's been an extensive uh, study. I think Putnam from Harvard uh, has written a, a book, and if you haven't uh, read it, it's a, it's a very interesting read. It's called Bowling Alone. And uh, how many of you have read Bowling Alone? And it, it's just about how in society today we're so, you know, you could be living just next door in a, in, a, in a condo, for instance, and you wouldn't know your neighbor, you know, at all. Uh, you may run into that individual on the elevator, but that's about it. But you have no sense of who this person is and, and what they're about. And so there are more and more things that we're doing in society is becoming more and more structured uh, around individualism. Uh, what are some comments uh, among residents about some of this? And, uh, and I, I purposefully made my presentation provocative uh, so we can, you know, we can discuss it. Is there a place in urology training for this? You know, and, and let's take, you know, even take a counter view. Say, no, there isn't a place uh, because it is something that you might pick up after you've got the nuts and bolts of your of your discipline. So let's just say uh, we get reviewed, and the external reviewer says, "Well, you really have not done a good job of uh, teaching and evaluating clinicians." And the program director, not me, of course, <laughs> says, "Well, this health advocacy is bullshit. Patients come to us with a problem, a symptom, a stone, a tumor." Absolutely. Population and public health, we have population health experts, public health experts. We can't be everything to everyone. It just doesn't seem reasonable. I mean, you know, we invest resources so that we can be competent uh, clinicians uh, and surgeons. Uh, how is it that you expect us to do all of that? Is there a counter to that, or, or how, how could you respond? And, you know, another uh, uh, parallel argument there is does just because it's part of now your review does that carrot and stick approach enable a real um, meaningful uh, in, uh, integration of health advocacy into the curriculum any responses to that Absolutely. I've heard about the infamous Red Book. How many of you know of the, the Red Book? It's a book, uh, Andrew, do you know about the Red Book? It's a, it's a resource uh, for, for uh, uh, across the disciplines uh, and specialties that you can go to uh, when you have situations where patients need sort of, uh, you know, above and beyond what the, what the healthcare system itself can offer. It means an intentional abandonment of the image of the professional as superior and detached problem solver. Professional education must promote the opening of professional life to meet clients and patients as also fellow citizens, persons with whom teachers, physicians, lawyers, nurses, accountants, engineers, and indeed all professionals share a larger common practice, that of citizen, working to contribute particular knowledge and specialized skills towards improving the quality of life, perhaps especially for those most in need. And uh, I think that looking beyond who you are as a specialist in your discipline 
and mores how your knowledge and skills can contribute to uh, some of the social issues um, that are prevalent uh, at a larger scale. Thank you for, for the time and, and uh, for your ear, and I'm open to suggestions on how I might be able to work with you to help bring some of this to fruition in your discipline. Thank you.